Well, good morning. Oh, wow, I got like one person, I think. Good morning. <laughs> Thanks, that makes me feel welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. It's a beautiful Palm Sunday, and uh, we're going to really kind of focus around that theme, of course, this morning. And our opening song is uh, Shout Hosanna, and Hosanna translated simply means save now. And so uh, we're, we're just going to celebrate the fact that God is a saving God here this morning. Before we get started, uh, just to welcome you to fill out that friendship register. It's the black book at the end of your row. Uh, it lets us know you're here. You can share prayer requests and praises in there as well. You also may have on your seat uh, those little note card sized things. Those are invites for next weekend. So uh, take one with you. There's more if you'd like more at the counters that are uh, on your way out this morning. If you'd like to grab more of those to hand out, we'd love for you to do that. If you're joining us online on our website today, there is a link for the Friendship Register beneath the video player. If you're on Facebook, just send us a message. Let us know how we can pray for you. We'd love to do that. I invite you to stand as we lift our voices together in worship. That's what we've gathered here to do this morning, isn't it? To lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 
You know, one of the things that uh, God's been working on in my life over the past few years, really, is just an appreciation for the church calendar and the seasons of the church calendar. And, you know, I grew up in this church, a modern evangelical church, and I think uh, in a lot of ways the evangelical movement maybe threw the baby out with the bathwater in some ways when it came to the church calendar because I had never heard things like Maundy Thursday before I went to college or some of even practice Lent, the season of Lent. And um, you kind of, if you recall, around Christmas time, we made a big deal about how Advent was a time of preparation and anticipation uh, for Christmas. And likewise, the Lenten season is a preparation and an anticipation for the Easter season. And so maybe you're, uh, haven't, uh, maybe you're like me and you weren't used to that sort of uh, periods of preparation and you haven't done a lot of that yet for this season. And maybe today is kind of the first you've even really thought about what Easter means. And I want to encourage you, if you're in that camp today, uh, to be intentional today. And we're going to focus on Palm Sunday and what that means. Uh, and then later this week, we'll have some opportunities to celebrate communion together and, and to reflect on what happened in the upper room on Maundy Thursday. Of course, Good Friday as Christ went to the cross. And then Easter Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection. And so I just encourage you, take this opportunity uh, to really reflect and to dwell on the meaning of this season. And uh, today, like I said, we're going to be intentional about uh, this kind of Hosanna and the triumphal entry and Palm Sunday. And so I've, I've got a video that I want to share with you. It takes a little bit of a humorous look at things, some of the misnomers maybe some people have about this time of year. Uh, but I think it will help, uh, my hope and prayer is that it will help all of us to really center around uh, this story as we begin this Passion Week together. And so as we watch this video, I invite you to go ahead and have a seat. Hey, Tommy and Eddie here to talk to you about something really great, Palm Sunday. Yeah, that's the Sunday that we paint our palms purple to commemorate King Saul talking to that palm reader lady, and then we wave him in the air. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's yes, not. Yes, it no. is. What Bible do you read? Palm Sunday commemorates the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Now picture this. Jesus rode in on a donkey while the crowds put their cloaks and palm branches all over the ground, shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. That's what I said. That's what I meant. Okay, now picture this. Jesus' popularity was going viral. I mean, he just raised Lazarus from the dead in the same community just a few days earlier. Wait, post-dead Lazarus was maybe at the very first Palm Sunday? Yeah, probably. That's so cool. I bet if he was there, he was probably like, And you're a thriller, thriller, Jesus. You raised me from the dead when you said, Get up, get up, get up, ooh! Now, to complete all of this, Jesus needed a donkey. Now, you'd think that a king or a prince would ride in on a horse, but not Jesus. He knew the message that he wanted to send. You see, a donkey represents peace. Anybody riding a donkey represented peaceful intentions. Yeah, it says right here in Matthew 21, it says that Jesus sent two of his disciples to get him a donkey. Yeah. Hey, I wonder which two he sent. Mm, maybe Thomas. I doubt it. I bet he sent Andrew. Andrew would totally do that, and probably... Tony. I bet he said Andrew and Tony. Tony's not a disciple. Oh, sorry. Tony is. It's still not a disciple. What translation of the Bible do you read? Jesus needed a donkey, so he asked two disciples to go get him a donkey. He told them they would find one in town, tied there next to a colt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he says, untie them and bring them to me. And if somebody asks you about it, you tell them the Lord needs them? Jeez. Yeah. What? Well, Jesus told his disciples to go steal a donkey for him. What Bible do you read? It doesn't say that at all. I can't figure this out. I mean, Jesus, he changed water into wine. Cool. He fed the 4,000. He fed right? the 5,000. What? He fed the 5,000. It doesn't matter. It does matter. Not the fourth. It's the 5,000. We're splitting hairs. I'm sorry. Jesus fed a large group of people. and That's cool. He, he healed people with leprosy. He raises Lazarus from the dead, and then boom, he's like, hey guys, go steal me a donkey. I'm just saying, I don't think that's very WWJD. The significance of Jesus riding in on a donkey, which he did not steal, was to fulfill the prophecy that is found in Zechariah 9.9. Yeah, but... The... And the king riding in on a lowly donkey with his way paved with palm branches, the palm branches symbolize triumph or victory. The what? The palm branches. The bra... I palm thought... branches, palm Sunday. The... 
I thought it was the palm. They should call it Branch Sunday, because that's confusing. We all have palms with us all the time. I just, I feel bad. I, I'm sorry, Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a time for us to prepare our hearts for the agony of his passion and the joy of his resurrection. So this week, let's cover the road to the cross with our hearts, our souls, and our minds as we reflect on the final week of Jesus' life. And let's celebrate in anticipation the return of the King of Kings. So proud that so many of you got that Doubting Thomas joke in there, by the way. One of the beautiful things about the church calendar is uh, that none of these things that we celebrate as a church stand on their own. They're part of a larger story. And so we get the privilege year after year of going through that story. And you might recall I mentioned uh, during the Advent season that uh, one of the things that we were focusing on was that Christ came for a purpose. And it's uh, in these moments that we approach the cross that we see that purpose being fulfilled. And so, uh, again, just a, a, we want to focus our hearts on this so that our celebration of Easter is that much more rich because we truly understand what happened and what he did for us. And so I invite you to stand, and we're going to sing a song that we actually sang at Christmas time called Shout for Joy, which uh, speaks of Christ as the saving one. Stand and join us. There's a song to raise. 
Yes, Lord. You are a victorious God. We praise you that, that we know the end of this story. Even though some of those who were at that first Palm Sunday may not have. We thank you that we have these constant reminders year after year of what you have done for us. If we're honest, we probably need those reminders more often. So I pray that the Spirit would bring those to mind often. Bring to mind what our Savior has done for us. And the depth of your love for us. Father, that was deep enough that you sent your Son, knowing full well that he was going to die on a cross. And Lord Jesus, uh, love so deep that you were willingly obedient to the Father. To die for me, a sinner who deserves separation for eternity. And yet, you've invited us into this story. So we praise you for the redemption that we have through the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, we are also so thankful this morning for a chance just to interact with your word together. To hear it preached and expounded upon. And Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts, soften them so that we might receive the word with humility this morning and we might be emboldened to obey through the power of your spirit working inside us. Praise you, God, that you're God that saves. Thank you that you continue to work on us through the process of sanctification. We pray today, these moments we spend in worship and in prayer and fellowship with other believers and in studying your word together might bring us further along in that process. So we come with humble hearts this morning, expectant that you're going to continue to speak to us through your word. Pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I see you all dug yourselves out of that snowstorm and got here. Do not forget, we still have a team from our church in Indian Nepal. They're in Nepal right now and continue to pray for them as they uh, serve Jesus Christ there with Bob Clinton, who is leading that team. Steve uh, and Mary Palmer got sick a little bit. I, I was told from Steve Ayers that Steve took it with him to share with his wife. So um, pray that they get all better and that sickness doesn't get passed on to other team members. And most of all, pray that the Holy Spirit works through our team to reach uh, boys and girls, men and women for Jesus Christ. That because of them going to uh, India and Nepal, that lives might be transformed into the image of Jesus by first receiving Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So continue to pray for them. Church, do we care about Jesus? Yes, we care about Jesus. That's why we're looking at the Gospel of Luke. And I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, please grab one in the seat in front of you. Or if you're in the front row, you're sitting on it. And so take that out and turn to page 50 at the back. 50 at the back, and that is Luke chapter 6. We spent already two weeks, uh, began looking at a sermon that Jesus preached Many call it the Sermon on the Plain. It's very similar to the Sermon on the Mount that Matthew records in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. But we're going to call it Sermon on the Plain because in verse 17, it says, of Luke 6, 17, Jesus came down with them, the 12 apostles whom he chose to follow him, and stood on a level place, that level place. And in verse 20, we see that he turned his gaze toward his disciples and he began to say, and he began preaching. So two weeks ago, I had a sermon titled, Disciples Listen to Their Teacher. Last week, Disciples Imitate Their Teacher. And today, Disciples Obey Their Teacher. Now, obedience doesn't come natural. 
Rebellion comes natural. Ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, mankind, you, me, we tend to rebel. It's in our nature. Growing up, on Sundays, my family went to church. My dad was a Sunday school teacher, which preceded church in those days. And so he got up early to review his lesson. And when it's time for the children to get up, me being one of the children, he would play music on what's called a turntable. Anybody remember what a turntable is? <laughs> He'd turn it on, this little stereo system that uh, turn it up. And so that meant to all of us children, it's time to get up. Being a rebellious boy, I would then what? Not get up. I would put the pillow over my head so I didn't have to listen to the music. Then came the announcement. Ruthie, Bobby, Becky, and Karen, time to get up. That was the announcement. I again disobeyed, did not get up. Then he came up, opened my door, and gave me the command, Bobby, get up. Yes, Dad. But as soon as he walked away, I stayed in bed. When he comes back the second time and opens the door and says, Bobby, get up, or then the threat came, I got up. Now, why? Why didn't I get up when I heard the music play the first time? I mean, that was taught to us. It's time to get up. There's three sisters, Bobby. If you want to get a shower, you better be first. Otherwise, you're going to church smelly. I don't get up. It's because we're rebellious by nature. I want to tell you this morning, disciples obey their teacher. And today we're going to look at contrast. What's the word? Contrast that Jesus draws between genuine followers of Jesus Christ and what I'm calling professing followers of Jesus Christ. Let's read the text. In Luke 6, beginning in verse 43. For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor, on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. And the evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the flood occurred, the torrent burst against the house, and it could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who has heard and has not acted is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation, and the torrent burst against it, and immediately it collapsed, and the ruin of that house was great. If you look at chapter 7, he's done with the sermon, he's going on to the next topic, next thing that happens in the life of Jesus. So he ends the sermon on that parable. Now just structurally, if you look at it, in verse 43 and 44, we have a contrast. In verse 45, well, the first 43 and 45 is like a parable. Then 45, he speaks about a contrast of men. And then you have the question. And then you start off with a contrast between men. And he ends up with a contrast in a parable about building. That's the structure. But the key verse is what's in the center, the question, which is, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Verse 46. Why is this question so important? Because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus doesn't make the question. He makes a statement. And the statement says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's why it's very important. Not everyone's going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, meaning eternal life, just because they say, Lord, Lord. Obedience matters. Disciples obey their teacher. And so my theme this morning is obedience to our Lord's commands is not optional for genuine followers of Jesus. It's not optional. 
for genuine followers of Jesus. See, belief in Jesus is linked with obedience. John makes this pretty clear in John chapter 3, verse 36. John writes this. He who believes in the Son. Who's the Son? It's Jesus Christ. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, the Son, you have eternal life. But he who does not believe. No, it doesn't say believe there. What does it say? Obey. Obey. He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. In that one verse, you can see belief and obedience, they're connected ideas, aren't they? To say that I believe in Jesus Christ, but I don't obey him is not a genuine belief. It's a faulty belief. And Jesus, in this section of Scripture, is addressing what a genuine follower or a believer looks like. Let's talk about genuine followers. First, in 43 through 45, we see that genuine followers demonstrate good actions from a good heart. They demonstrate good actions from a good heart. Now, you're looking at the notes that I put on the ledge there and saying, how is he going to get through this in 45 minutes? Well, I'm not. See, this is the second hour. I can go as long as I want to. The first hour, 9 o'clock, I've got to get done around 10 o'clock because we have another service at 10.30. So I'm I'm pressed for time. But this one, I relax. And I take my time. And you're thinking, if you take your time, you're going to lose me. Well, to be honest, I've lost some of you already. (laughs) Genuine followers demonstrate good actions from a good heart. Let's look at the parable first, the contrast in the parable of trees. Look at the contrast. Look in the text. Don't look at my face. Look at the Bible. He says in verse 43, there is no good tree which produces bad fruit. Or to word it differently, a good tree does not produce bad fruit. What do I mean by bad fruit? It means it's really inedible. It could be rotten. It's bad fruit. Now, let me ask you a question. Is it possible that there can be a bad branch on a very good tree that has bad fruit on it? Well, yeah. In, I'm not going to go into plant life, but it is possible. What Jesus is saying here is not that there can't be a bad piece of fruit on the tree. He's speaking in a way that's called collective. It's collective. So if I want to say it in a positive way, a good tree produces good fruit, correct? A good tree normally produces good fruit. Healthy fruit, edible fruits. And likewise, a bad tree does not produce good fruit. Now, is it possible also that a tree on the inside is all rotted out by some kind of worm or, and, and eats out the inside of the, the main root of the tree, but the outside where the bark is, there's still enough life that there could be good fruit on a bad tree? Yeah, see, it's a collective idea. He's not making a general principle that every good tree only has good fruit. What he's saying overall, when you look at it, this is holding true. Bad trees normally produce bad fruit. A rotten tree usually has rotten fruit on it. And then he gives us application. Each tree is known by its own fruit, right? Each tree is known by its own fruit. So in what he just said in verse 43, the fruit is an indication of the tree's health. If it's a healthy tree, a good tree, it's going to have good fruit. If it's a bad tree, unhealthy tree, it's going to have bad fruit. It's an indication of the tree's health, but also the fruit is an indication of the tree's nature. That's what the rest of verse 44 talks about. The fruit of a tree is always true to the tree's character. I have another preacher in amongst me here, but that's okay. I can talk louder. Notice what he says. He goes on to say in verse 44, for men do not gather figs from thorns, right? The answer is what? That's correct. Nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. See, the fruit of a tree is always true to its characters. Figs are not gathered from the thorny plant. Figs come from fig trees. And grapes are not picked from a briar bush or bramble. Grapes are gathered from a grapevine. 
So we can agree to this principle, right? Or do I have to spell it out some more? Apples come from? Oranges come from? Orange. Bananas come from? Bananas. Figs come from? Fig tree. Grapes come from? Vines. <laughs> Vines. Let's look at the explanation. Does Jesus explain that parable in verses 43 and 44? No, he doesn't. He doesn't. We're not told who the bad trees are and who has the bad fruit. We're not told who the good trees are and who has the good fruit. We're just not told. But in the Sermon on the Mount, if you turn back to Matthew chapter 7, actually I have it on the screen for you, this is what Matthew says about this passage. He says in verse 15, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their, by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? Well, no. So every good tree bears good fruit, and the bad tree bears bad fruit. And a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree does not bear good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. You will know them. And so in the context of Matthew, who's the them? It's the false prophets that he said it back in verse 15. So is Jesus then saying, hey, here are the false prophets. You'll know them by their fruit. And here I am, the good prophet, and you'll know me by my fruit. That's the contrast he's kind of making in Matthew. But is that the contrast he's making here in Luke? Well, let's go back to verse 17. This is right before he tells this whole message. Jesus came down from the mount where he chose 12 of the disciples to be his apostles. He came down with them and stood on a level place. And there was a large crowd of his disciples and a great throng of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the coastal region and Tyre and Sidon. So here we have two large crowds all in the same one large crowd. The one large crowd has the large crowd of disciples and a great throng of people. And I think what Jesus is saying here in Luke chapter 6 is that the contrast is between those two groups. He's pointing out not everyone in the crowd is really going to be my follower, even though they've come to him. And by the way, is there any place in Scripture where we are to be judges of another person's fruit? No. Just like we're not to be spect inspectors when we have logs in our own eye, so also we're not to be fruit inspectors looking at people and making value judgments whether or not they're a Christian. Who decides whether a person's a Christian? God will do that. He will make that decision. What he's saying here is, look, if the inner core of your life has really been changed, you'll be bearing good fruit. If the inner core of your life has not been changed, overall, you'll be bearing bad fruit, meaning you'll live for yourself. Now let's look at the next contrast, which is the contrast in people in verse 45. Contrast in people. He starts off with the good man. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good. The heart is the source where we either have goodness or evil. But let me tell you, until salvation occurs, there is no good heart. There's only that bad heart. And you need a heart transplant. In Matthew, or let's say Mark 7, rather, Mark 7, verse 21, Jesus says, For from within, out of the heart of women, actually it says men, but really it means male and female, okay, from out of the heart of men proceed what? Evil thoughts, fornication, sex outside of marriage, thefts, 
murder, adulteries, deeds of coveting, wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. That's a pretty big list, isn't it? He goes on to say, all these evil things proceed from within and defile a man. What's, what's within us? Every one of us. Well, he just gave us a whole list. Now, honestly, we don't like to think of ourselves as evil, do we? Evil is, you know, Hitler, those kind of guys. They're evil monsters. No, he's using evil here as a contrasting to the word good. It just means bad. It means, well, we would say righteous and unrighteous. We don't like to think of ourselves having evil inside. After all, psychology and sociology teach us that humans are basically good, who tend once in a while to do bad things. But the Bible says just the opposite. The Bible says ever since Adam and Eve rebelled against God, mankind is depraved. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. We are depraved. Now, we can do some good, but overall, we are not good. We're sinners. We're corrupt inside. But who can change a man's heart from evil to good? Well, God can. That's why he sent his son, Jesus. Jesus died on the cross, and through faith in him, we have a heart transplant. We are changed from the inside. That's why he says, Jesus says to Nicodemus in John 3.3, 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Everyone needs a new birth. You need to be born of water, a natural birth, and born of the Spirit, he goes on to say. And in John 3, 16, he makes it clear how you get this new birth when he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send his Son into the world to judge you or condemn you, but that the world through Jesus might be saved. You have a new birth when you put your faith and trust in Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Then you get a changed heart, right? That's when you get a new heart. And once you get the new heart, now you have the ability to have good things come out of the good treasure of your hearts. Now let's look at the evil man. Opposite of good. It says, out of the evil treasure, meaning of his heart, he brings forth the evil. See, that which is in one's inner nature determines what the fruit is going to be yielded, what's going to happen. And he gives the application here, the mouth speaks from, I'm going to say the overflow of the heart, like the English Standard Version has. The mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. What comes out of one's mouth usually re reflects what's in one's heart. You only have to talk to somebody for a, an extended period of time and you realize what really is inside that heart. I had a dear friend who loved riding motorcycles with me and we'd have lunch every Friday. We'd ride somewhere when it was nice riding weather. He was a mechanic. He came to faith in Jesus Christ very late in life. The former pastor led him to the Lord, but since we both liked motorcycle riding, we rode together and we'd have lunch together. And he'd always confess to me as we sat across the booth, he says, I just blew it again. I can't get a handle on my mouth. When something goes wrong with the machinery, I swear. I said, what, what am I, your priest? You got to confess this to me? <laughs> so I said to him, what do you do about that? Well, I told you. <laughs> I said, you're telling the wrong person. You need to confess that to God. Do you agree with what you just said? And the language that came out of your mouth doesn't reflect what's happened in your heart. He goes, yeah, no, it doesn't. I said, well, did you confess that as sin to the Lord? No. Well, I think you need to do that. So the, a couple weeks later, he comes in and goes, I blew it again. I go, what do you mean? He says, I'm just swearing when something goes wrong, when I can't fix something. I said, well, what did you do about it? I told the Lord. <laughs> I said, yes, that's what you got to do. But you know, over time, his mouth changed. And pretty soon the Gideons wanted him to be a public speaker for the Gideons. God changes. Does he change your mouth immediately? 
In some cases, maybe yes. But overall, it's a spirit working in the heart that changes start to happen slowly over time. But Jesus is saying pretty clearly here, the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. That's why in James chapter 3, verses 10 through 11, he, James says, brothers, sisters, brothers, from the same mouth should not come blessings and cursings. Because out of the fountain, you don't get both salt water and fresh water. God starts changing your speech when your heart's been changed. First, genuine followers demonstrate good actions from a good heart. Secondly, genuine followers obey the Lord's commands. Now he reverses it. He gives us the contrast in people before he gives us a contrast in parable. So let's look at the contrast in people. First, we have what I'm calling professing believers or professing followers of Jesus. It comes from the question in verse 46. They profess to know the Lord. They say, Lord, Lord. Double usage of the word Lord attempts to show verbally that they have allegiance to Jesus as the master. Lord, Lord. But Jesus calls them out right away by saying, then why don't you do what I say? Jesus is saying, you really are a false disciple when you make a profession of faith. You follow me as Lord, but you do not obey me. Professing believers. And then he goes right into a genuine believer or a genuine follower of Jesus. And you can see in the next verse, verse 47, three verbal ideas in a row. Now, in the Greek, these are participles. Participle means you have an I-N-G on the end of the word. So everyone coming to me and hearing my words and acting on them. See, those are the three things of a genuine disciple. A genuine disciple will do those three. They'll come to Jesus, they will hear what he's saying, commanding, and then they act on them. They do them. They do what Jesus says. Those who profess belief in Jesus, they do the first two. They come to Jesus and they hear his words, but they don't do them. I believe the Christian church has a lot of professing believers. Those who come, maybe every Sunday they come to church. They come because, well, Jesus is the church, and I want to be part of Jesus. And they come, and they hear the message, but they just don't, well, really, they don't even hear it. And they certainly don't do it. And so Jesus closes this sermon with one last parable to illustrate the contrast between a genuine disciple and a professing disciple or follower of Jesus. So let's look at the contrast by parable of men building a house. The genuine follower of the Lord is the man who says he dug deep and he laid a foundation on the rock. And at the very end of verse 48, it says it was well built. The house had been well built. This man has nothing to fear when judgment comes. This one has nothing to fear when the day of judgment comes. And he describes it with this, when the flood occurred, the torrent of this flood burst against the house, and he could not shake it because it was well built. In the Bible, floods and storms are often pictures of God's judgment. Because you don't like reading Ezekiel, I'm bringing this next illustration out of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 13, verse 9. The Lord is speaking through Ezekiel, and the Lord is speaking, and he says, So my hand will be against the prophets who see false visions and utter lying divinations. Now go to verse 10. It says, It is definitely because they have misled my people by saying peace when there is no peace. 
And when anyone builds a wall, here comes the illustration, when anyone builds a wall, behold, they plaster it over with whitewash. So tell those who plaster it over with whitewash that it will fall. And here's the illustration of destruction. A flooding rain will come, and you, O hailstones, will fall, and a violent wind will break out. Behold, when the wall has fallen, will you not be asked, where is the plaster with which you plastered it? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will make a violent wind break out in my wrath. There will also be in my anger a flooding rain and hailstones to consume it in wrath. Can you see the metaphor of judgment? He goes on to say, so I will tear down the wall which you have plastered over with whitewash and bring it down to the ground so that the foundation is laid bare. And when it falls, you will be consumed in its midst and you will know that I am the Lord. Thus, I will spend my wrath on the wall and on those who have plastered it over with whitewash. And I will say to you, the wall is gone and its plasterers are gone, along with the prophets of Israel who prophesy to Jerusalem and who see visions of peace for her when there is no peace, declares the Lord God. Pretty clear, right? God uses the metaphor of floods and storms to show judgments. And so in this parable, he's showing judgment by the fact of this flooding occurring, torrent bursting against the house and could not shake it. God's judgment. The man, woman who has built a foundation on a rock has nothing to fear. What about the professing follower of the Lord? What's the contrast? Well, notice what it says in verse 49. The one who has heard and has what? Not acted. Not acted. Meaning not acted on Jesus' words. This man built a house on the ground. This man did not lay a foundation. It says without a foundation. Now understand this. There are two houses I think they look alike. The only difference is one of the houses, the guy dug deep into the ground, found the rock, and laid the foundation on the rock. But from the outside, from ground up, which you see when you look at a house, you don't know there's a foundation under there. But there is. The other house that's built on the ground, you look at the house, it looks exactly like the other house, and you think, this is a good house. But there's no foundation. You know what that tells me? There are people that sit in the midst of the crowd of people that come to church, and we have people that may be looking like they are what? A Christian. On the outward appearance, they look solid. But their life's not on the foundation of the rock. And so what happens when judgment comes? Well, I think they have fear. They have a cause to fear on the day of judgment. The torrent burst against this house. Immediately it collapsed, and the ruin of the house was great. And Jesus ends his message, his sermon, on that note. So I ask you, what's the difference between the two houses? It's the foundation on the rock, isn't it? And this parable is called an analogy. It makes a contrast. And the one who built his house on the foundation of the rock is the one who comes to Jesus, hears the words of Jesus, and does them. This one has no fear of future judgment because they are genuine followers. However, the one who builds a house without a foundation is the one who hears the words of Jesus and does not act on them. This one has every reason to fear on the day of judgment. Just because you profess faith in Jesus Christ doesn't mean you are a follower or believer in Jesus Christ. That's why in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That means glory. That means eternal life. But he who does the 
will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. What's it saying? It's talking about obedience. Later on in Luke chapter 8, verses 20, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and her, the brothers of Jesus come to Jesus. And Jesus says these words. He says, my mother and my brothers, my family is what he's saying, are those who hear the word of God. They hear the word of God and do it. It's about obedience. They do it. Obedience to our Lord's commands is not optional for genuine followers of Jesus because obedience is the proof of our belief in him. It's the proof. I don't know how many of you like church historians. Anybody? Justin Martyr, in 155 A.D., he wrote a series of apologies, meaning defenses. And he said this in Apology number 16. He said, let those who are, let me get this right, and let those who are not found living as Jesus taught be understood to be no Christians, even though they profess with the lip the precepts of Christ. For not those who make a profession, but those who do the works shall be saved. According to Christ's word, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. He goes on to say, and so to those who are not living pursuant to these teachings are Christians only in name. And then he rather strongly writes, we demand that all such be punished by you. That's kind of heavy. Let's leave the punishment to God. But he's making it pretty clear. Without obedience, you're just a professing. And according to Justin Martyr, you're just no Christian at all. Because Christ doesn't give you the option of put your faith in me and then go live the way you want to live. He doesn't give you that option. Now, let me ask you this. Does anyone obey completely or perfectly? No. 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 We still have what's called a sin nature, and we still fail, and we still sin. But you know, the one who has had a heart change has also been given the Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do when you start to disobey? Well, he starts to let you know about that. And the Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin. But we, in our stubbornness, sometimes say, okay, but I don't want to change. I like this sin. So the Lord says, okay, I came to you quietly through the Spirit to give you conviction, but you're still in rebellion, so now i am got to take it a step further, and now comes what's called discipline. And discipline won't seem good to the follower of Jesus Christ. In fact, it's painful. But the Lord loves those who are his, and he loves it us so much he will discipline us when we get off track. And that's why in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, if you are without discipline, you better question whether or not you're really in the family. Because a father will discipline those he loves. Obedience to our Lord's commands not optional, and when you start to disobey, the Lord will let you know. And he seeks confession. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's look at this whole sermon. Starts in verse 20 and goes to verse 49. And let's look at the difference between a genuine disciple, a genuine follower of Jesus. Remember, he is speaking to two classifications of people, the great throng of people and a large crowd of disciples. And so what I want to let you know is let's go backwards. The genuine follower of Jesus builds his or her life on the foundation of the rock. The foundation of who? Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.11 says, Jesus is the foundation. 
Secondly, the genuine follower of Jesus comes to Jesus, hears his teachings, and acts on them. It's the whole point of this message. They act on them. Jesus is Lord and demands my obedience. Anybody else squirming when I say that? Or just me? Third, the genuine follower of Jesus has had a heart change. The inner being has been changed through the new birth process. And therefore, after the new birth, this now produces good fruit from the good treasure of the heart that's been changed. Fourth, the genuine follower of Jesus is not a fault finder in others. We are not, we are not spect inspectors looking for the sins in other people's lives. No, the genuine follower examines themselves and deals with their own sin before even thinking about helping others with their sin. Fifth, the genuine follower of Jesus sees himself or sees herself as a pupil in the process of becoming fully trained by the master. We're in process, we're in training, and when we are fully trained, we are gonna be looking like the teacher, right? That was from last week's message. Six, the genuine follower of Jesus is merciful. He or she is not judgmental. He or she is not condemning of others but he or she rather forgives others and generously gives to them. They're merciful. Seven, the genuine follower of Jesus is loving. He or she even loves their enemies. They do good to those who hate them. They bless those who curse them. They pray for those who mistreat them. And they give freely without expecting repayments. Remember, treat others as you would have them treat you. And then when you look at the blessings and the woes of the very beginning of this message, number eight is the genuine follower of Jesus will live contrary to the values of this world. He or she doesn't strive for earthly riches, for full bellies, for a life of carefree laughter, nor to be liked by all. Those were the four woes. And how quickly do we get sucked into those? See, the genuine follower of Jesus recognizes that there's a cost to following him. And Jesus started out this whole message by saying he or she may experience economic hardship. Blessed are the poor. Maybe hunger. Maybe sorrow. And maybe even persecution here on earth. And Jesus says, blessed are you who are persecuted for my name. We hear it. Looking at those nine, are we going to act on them? Today is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, when we recall Jesus making his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, riding on the colt of a donkey. The crowd hailed him as king, shouting, Hosanna, save now. And yet, in five days, the crowd is yelling something else to Pilate. What's the crowd yelling? <laughs> Crucify him. And I wonder how many in that crowd were shouting Hosanna just five days earlier. This morning, you're in a crowd, a small crowd, but you're in a crowd. And I ask you, which follower are you? 
the whole message Jesus is addressing to his disciples. Read verse 20. He's addressing his disciples in this great crowd of people, which is a large throng of people and a large group of his disciples. And this whole message is addressed to those disciples in that great crowd. And he's, and he's kind of like reminding them, hey, let me tell you what it really means to be a follower of me. And so I ask you, are you a genuine follower of Jesus? Professing that you know him doesn't give you the right to enter into the kingdom. You have to have a heart change. And the heart change then allows you to obey. For true disciples obey their Lord. Father, we come before you, and you know our hearts. Many in this room have had that heart change when they came to faith in Jesus Christ, admitting their sin, coming before the Savior, and asking him to forgive and cleanse. But forgive us for the times that we will call you Lord and do not do the things you say. But Lord God, you made it really clear through the scripture today, through parable and through contrasts, the difference between a believer a genuine believer, a genuine disciple, a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, and a false one. For any that profess to know Jesus but have not had a conversion yet, a changed heart, may they humble themselves this morning and come to the cross And seek out Jesus as Savior and Lord. For many of us who have followed Jesus for a while, what a great reminder what it is to be that follower. Help us to continue, knowing that we have nothing to fear of future judgment. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We want to send you out uh, with a song this morning that uh, still focuses on the fact that God is a God who saves. And so this is a, a new one for us, and it's just called God That Saves. And uh, my hope is that uh, it's really a blessing to you as we continue uh, entering into this story and being intentional about uh, deepening our understanding of the events of this week so that uh, again, as we celebrate Easter, that has a richer meaning. And so you can just stay seated. Um, if you know the song or you start to know it and you want to sing, feel free to do that. Uh, but if you would rather just allow these uh, lyrics to wash over you, uh, that's fine too. I hope you're blessed by it. This soul once told in beaten 
allows me to enter into his rescue plan. Amen. This week is about what Christ came to do. He came to die on a cross for us and to rise again and to defeat sin and Satan forever. We get to share in that. Praise God. Praise God. We have a couple more opportunities this week. If you're interested, as we've been talking about this morning and just deepening your celebration this time of year, uh, first of all, on Thursday night, we're going to have a Maundy Thursday service here at 6.30. And uh, really that service is focused on the time that was spent in the upper room. And so this is going to be our uh, time of communion. So normally we have communion uh, on the first of the month, but that's Easter Sunday. And so we're going to do communion this Thursday night. So if you'd like to come for that, that whole service is really going to uh, revolve around that communion celebration. And then on Good Friday at the Dakota United Methodist Church is the state line Good Friday service. And so we'd welcome you to attend that on Friday at 630. And then, of course, uh, back here, Easter Sunday morning, not in this room, but down in our gymnasium at 10 o'clock, we're going to have one service, everyone together, an Easter celebration service. Uh, but we will have a uh, fellowship time starting at 9 o'clock. The Northwest classrooms will be pretty well cleared out there. And so we invite you to just to come anytime after 9. Uh, come hang out, fellowship with one another, uh, spend some time visiting with each other, and then we'll have the service at 10. Um, you should have had on your seat an invite card 
If you didn't get one, there are more at the doorways to take with you, but invite someone to come next weekend. Um, The gospel is going to be presented even in the Easter story, and so uh, we'd love for us to really just fill that gym up with people. So take those, invite somebody, uh, don't just throw it at them, have a conversation, invite them, and give it to them so they know the time of that. Uh, Also, if you came prepared to give an offering this morning, there are boxes at the doorway to do that. If you're visiting with us, uh, welcome to you. We're glad that you're here. You're under no obligation to give to that offering, Uh, but I'd love to meet you. I know Pastor Bob would love to meet you, or you can stop by the counter, the welcome counter out in the commons. They'd love to meet you there, too. Uh, We'd love to get to know your names and uh, see if we can get you plugged into our church. So come say hi. Uh, Have a great week. We hope to see you at some of our services this week in the middle of the week or at the very least back for Easter Sunday at 10 o'clock next weekend. We'll see you then.